Hello, everybody, and welcome to the seventh webinar in our series around the pandemic. My name is Janice McPherson, and I'm the Director of Operations with CPHR Alberta. It's great to have you here. This might be your first webinar with us. It might be your seventh or something in between, but welcome. It's great to have you. Uh, we're finally having some spring weather here in Calgary, and I hope you are too, wherever you might be. I want to let you know that you're automatically muted when you come into the webinar, so you don't need to worry about any noise in the background wherever you're located today. And I want to welcome our presenter, Stephen Armstrong. Steve is a leadership speaker, coach, and consultant working in his own company, Paradis Education. We're very grateful that Steve is giving us his time and knowledge this morning, and he'll be talking about leadership in the time of crisis. I also want to thank Haley, who's here today from the marketing team as our technical support. We'll be sending you a follow-up email uh, with the slides from today and a recording of the presentation. You'll get that tomorrow. And if you're a designated member, you should keep a copy of your email for your CPD credits. If you're not a member of CPHR Alberta, welcome. It's great to have you here with us. If you're interested in finding out more about becoming a member, I'm going to put our email address in the chat for the webinar and you can uh, contact us afterward and we can talk about that. You don't have to be an HR professional to be a member, so we can give you more info on all of that. Throughout the webinar today, the Q&A will be open. You should see that button at the bottom of your screen. Put any questions you have in there and Steve will answer as many as possible during the last part of the webinar. The chat will be open too, but if you've got a question, it's best to put it in the Q&A so I can see it when we get to the end. And if you have any technical issues, send a chat to the host and Haley will help you out. And with that, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Steve. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, wherever you're at. Thanks, Janice, for the gracious uh, introduction and the opportunity to talk with everybody today. Um, we're going to move through a few slides and then hopefully we'll have lots of time at the end for conversations. Um, I believe that uh, uh, Janice might have been a little scared. I'm just going to shut off my video not to distract you. But I know my face is more for radio than for television at any rate, so just bear with me a second. So again, my name is Steve Armstrong and I'm currently working in the leadership uh, business as a coach, educator, consultant, and I speak at keynotes and conferences. In fact, I spoke last year in Edmonton at the at your conference, the HR conference, and then I did a couple of workshops in the fall. Uh, more to the point about today is my career as a soldier and as an emergency management expert uh, with uh, both the Canadian Army and then following that with uh, Red Cross. And uh, in that experience, I've seen pretty well everything a human being can do to another human being and do for another human being. And my one lesson out of all of that is that uh, despite what we read in the news and what we hear, for the most part, people are good, decent, and try hard. And in crisis, most often, they rise to the surface and they bring the, brings out the best in people. And when it doesn't bring out the best in people, it's often a fault of leadership and communication. And that's really what I'm gonna to speak to a bit today. Um, so Pat, Patrick Lenschioni uh, is a great writer. Uh, I'm a big fan of his. Uh, he wrote uh, Five Fables of a Team and writes a lot about trust. And on a recent podcast, he mentioned uh, this quote. It's, it's a variation. You may have heard different ones in the past. Uh, is that never squander this opportunity to be better. And what he's saying in that, in this particular time of COVID and this pandemic, is that what we're facing right now is a giant pause. <laughs> Normally when we bump into an emergency or a disaster, it's isolated either by uh, physical location or geographic location, and it's quite time bound. Um, this one's quite different because everybody's impacted worldwide, certainly across North America and across Canada. And the time bound is out the window. We're not exactly sure what the heck is happening as far as when this is going to wrap up. You know, we hear people force, trying to force the issue of getting back to business in some jurisdictions uh, within the next few weeks. And then we hear other people being very cautious and thinking of possibly months, if not to the fall. But this is an opportunity for us to try to be better. And it's a great opportunity because nobody expects us to be perfect when these things happen to us. And uh, so let's 
talk about, we'll talk a little bit about taking the time and how we're going to um, move forward. So uh, most of you, if you're here in Calgary and Southern Alberta, you know the Stony Dakota people live uh, on, a, on a First Nations land between here and Banff, between Calgary and Banff. And uh, I was at, a, at an event one time and one of the elders of the Stony Dakota people uh, told the story of the buffalo and the prairies long before the settlers came. And in those days, in the ancient days, when animals and First Nations people moved freely uh, across the prairies, um, there would be these huge windstorms and fires, uh, firestorms and grass fires and stuff would, would tear across the prairies and, and be quite vicious and mean. And most animals uh, would run in front of the storm. If it was a fire, they would run in, in the direction the fire was coming from, away from the fire and they would run fast and hard trying to outrun the storm that way. And eventually they would just exhaust themselves and run themselves into the ground and then eventually be overtaken by the storm or the wildfires and, and succumb to their uh, exhaustion and succumb to the storm. Whereas the buffalo, the Great Plains bison, would actually turn into the storm, turn into the wildfire and move back against it. Therefore, by the, what they would be doing was reducing the amount of time they'd be exposed to the elements and they would get through the storm a lot faster. And then on the other side, once they got through the storm and, the, and, and on the other side in the calm weather that, that followed up behind the storm, they were able to settle down and start reestablishing themselves. And I would argue this is a perfect analogy for what we're facing. The COVID pandemic is the storm that we're facing. And we could try to outrun it and ignore it, or worse, ignore it. But really what we want to do is turn into it and, and come through at the other end. And how do we come through at the other end stronger, better, is really what we're talking about in this conversation about crisis leadership. Any monkey can survive the emergency phase of a disaster generally, or in this case, COVID. But it takes a thoughtful, uh, considered, and an intelligent person to be able to come through a disaster stronger, better, and bring your people along with you. We've all worked hard to build our organizations with a great reputation for results and bringing value to our stakeholders internally and externally. And most importantly, we worked hard to build trust within our team. And we should not allow this crisis to be, to waste that, what we've built up. Um, I was joking with uh, Janice before we started the call and that uh, I've had a mix, mixed results as a married, as a husband. I, I failed twice and I've finally become decent. And I do know for a fact that all of the brownie points you build up with your partner, um, you can build them up over a long period of time and have quite a bank of, of trust and brownie points with, uh, with your partner. But it only takes one mistake to eliminate all of those brownie points. And in your team, it only takes one misstep to eliminate all of the trust you built up there. And do not waste it. That's valuable. That's more important to you as a leader in a crisis than any, uh, in, or any uh, money you could spend or develop you could do. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing I would say to all of you on the call is that we need to figure out how to be exceedingly human. When I say that, we have to work extra hard to have human contact and human connection with our people, especially when we're dealing with people via video and via telephone. It's hard enough when we're in the same office to be able to take the time and connect on a human level. And what we really need to do here is be exceedingly human. We need to double down on this. You'll hear me say double down probably more than you care to hear over the next little bit. But we really have to work at this. And, and the Chinese have a saying that, that uh, the best time to plant a tree is 80 years ago. And the second best time is to start now, is to plant the tree now. Same thing with trust. We should have built up this cachet of trust with our people long before we needed it now. But if you, if you haven't, don't think you have that trust, it's now is the time to start. Now is the time to build trust on your team. And we can do that by being humble by admitting we don't know what's going on necessarily with everybody, 
admitting that we are a little concerned about the future of our organization or our community or our family. Now we're struggling at home with our children and our dogs and our spouses, everybody fighting for internet bandwidth to do their work uh, or watch Netflix or whatever it is. Like be human and, and share that information with people and draw that conversation out with your people. We need to push this is not the time to sit on information that we have. Now is the time to push it. Everything that's reasonably and appropriately uh, shareable with your team, you should share it. Everything from start times to who's in the office, what's going on, uh, what sort of services and supports are available. And we need to be able to promote uh, credible sites and sources. This is not the time to be dragging out Gwyneth Paltrow. This is the time to rely on Dr. Henshaw, the Chief Public Health Officer for Alberta, or Dr. Tam. Um, bring credible information. There's great sites out there, uh, your own, the uh, CPHR sites. Uh, the Calgary Chamber of Commerce has an excellent site for information around pandemic and about employment and, and benefits that the government are providing. So find this information and push it out. You'd be surprised how many people don't know where this stuff is, or they're hearing about it, but they've never went to look for it. Be proactive and share this information. We have to manage fear. If you're not the least bit concerned about what's going on in this world right now, then you've missed the point. <laughs> this is a scary time. I remember dealing when I was the director, ops director for uh, the SARS response in Ontario, we weren't sure if the planets were going to be ruling, the, uh, or the apes were going to be ruling the planet come the end of the summer uh, after SARS. We had no idea what was going to happen next. So acknowledge it and deal with it. Be upfront about it. Failure to address these fear, fear can result in contagious paralysis. So if, we, if people start bogging down in worry and fret, what happens is they bog down in their worries and they focus on what's right in front of them. They can't be thoughtful and strategic. The human brain is very challenged when it comes to fear. It goes back to when we were running through the jungles uh, with clubs in our hands. And when we would hear a crack in the, in the forest, we were trying, oh, had to figure out right away whether it was a saber tooth tiger or not. And when that happens, your, your focus, your, your, uh, Peripheral vision narrows in focus, your hearing intenses, your heart rate comes up, your bloody is, body is flooded with uh, adrenaline to be able to fight or run away or whatever it's going to be. But when that happens, you can't be thoughtful because you don't have time in those moments of crisis and fear to be able to think rationally because you have to decide, should I fight it? Should I run away from it? And that's what's happening to your people at home. So we need to work hard at containing and identifying the fear. We need to be persistent and leaning into our people. We need to be persistent in our role as a boss. Now is not the time to sit back on your hands. Now is the time to be fully engaged with your people. We need to tell them everything about what to do, where to go, how to be safe. I mentioned some of these things a little bit earlier. Never be asked or lie to your people. In the army, we had a saying, the soldiers could tell a lie from a million miles. They know when someone's feeding them a line of BS and your people are the same. So if, some, if you, uh, someone asks you a question about when are we getting back to work? Don't tell them, if you don't know the precise answer, you don't tell them. Just say, I don't know when we're gonna get back to work. I'm going to tell you something. Every time we get together as a team and have a conversation, I commit to you that I'll get back to you with either an update or a definitive answer when I can. And even if you don't have the answer, remember to circle back and go back to them and say, I didn't forget about the question you asked the other day. I'm working on it. And as soon as I have a good answer or the, an answer for you, I'll, uh, I commit to come back to you. We as bosses and leaders and human beings have two ears and one mouth for a reason. That we should be listening twice as hard as we should be talking. So this is super important to us, especially in your field as HR professionals, because you are sort of, in, not, I'll say informal leaders, your, your leadership within the organization, but you're generally not in the direct lines of authority and chain of, 
uh, old school language, chain of command. So you can move through and you're generally perceived to be a safe place to go. So what we need to start to do is monitoring the conversations in the lunch rooms. And I don't mean spying and sneaking around behind the door and eavesdropping, but if you're in the lunchroom, the coffee room, people are talking, you hear what they're saying. And remember how their conver the conversation is going because the questions they're asking each other as human beings, one-on-one -on -one as peers, they're apt never to ask that question to their boss. And when we're talking to people, it should be in a very conversational manner because this is the time, as I said earlier, to be exceedingly human. We need to be more conversational. We need to take more time to listen and hear. And when we're talking to people, we really need to try our very best to use silence as a tool. So when someone asks you a question, make sure you pause before you start to answer it. Because if you jump right in and start answering that question, they think, they, they will assume that you didn't really hear what they had to say. And if somebody's talking to you and you're not sure of the answer, um, ask them to repeat it or rephrase the question and that will buy you time to think it through. That, that opportunity for you to go quiet will buy you time to think it through to be able to respond. And if you're having a conversation and it's going a little bit sideways, just go quiet. It's like the border officers do, right? They ask you where you've been, how long you've been out of the country, and then they go completely quiet because they know the average human being uh, will start rattling off and prattling off about all of the things they bought and how much uh, extra duty they got away with as they crossed the border. One of our jobs, and especially in the HR world, I would argue one of your most important jobs is to stay on top of misinformation and respond to rumors. So when you hear things that are wrong, and you hear a rumor, it's your job to jump on top of that and make sure that you correct it. And at least make sure that you tell people that it's not correct and you will get back to them with the right answer. And you need to always be looking for what, and the, 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 the sort of summation of this conversation is that you need to work hard at finding out what people are looking for and proactively give it to them. We need to be so persistently human and exceedingly human in the connection. So it's like, get human. We need to talk to our team every day. More so than we're even when we're working in the same office area. We need to be connecting with our people every day. So we need an informal team meeting every day. And it should be focused on, uh, we'll talk about a rallying call as a little bit later on, but we need to have a team rallying call. What are we doing what, and why? Are we, what are we focusing on? You need to invest a bit of time in checking in and out with your people all the time, as much as possible. People are Zoomed or WebExed or whatever it is to death. Like, honestly, I, I was on a WebEx or a Zoom wet wedding yesterday and a baby shower on Friday and a happy hour or baby shower Sunday and a happy hour on Friday and a whole bunch of meetings last week. I'm sick of it myself. So can you imagine your people on your team? What I would suggest is you start breaking out this, your video conferencing and phone conferencing by meetings and by themes. So deal with one question, one subject, one theme, deal with it fully and completely, sign off, take a break, take a bio break, come back to the conversation and start restart a separate meeting a bit later on. And again, separate it out by topic and theme and continually be looking for what your people need from you. It's the unstated questions that will give you the information in a crisis that people are worried about. And if somebody says something a little bit off base, when I say that, not, not inappropriate, but something doesn't sound right, make a note and make sure you loop back to that person after the call, after the meeting and say, hey, uh, Mary or Bobby, listen, I heard you ask this question. You said this during the meeting. Can you help me figure out what you're really talking about? because they're asking a question in a way that's not coming across clearly. There's something in the back of their mind that's worrisome to them in this crisis. And we need to figure out how to draw that information out. In crisis communication, there's a couple of things that we need to be very clear about. First off, we need to understand that no matter what, how well we're planning and how good we are at a job, something is always gonna go wrong. So Murphy's Law says that if anything could possibly go wrong, it will go wrong. We need to be calm, empathetic, and care. So if 
work at lowering your tone of your voice and slowing your cadence down in your language. You'll hear it as I'm, even as I'm speaking, this is not necessarily my normal conversational talk. This is how I speak to people in, you know, in a, in a, excuse me, in a, in a lecture setting or even when, especially when I was doing emergency crisis, it was like, stay calm, stay calm and listen and care. Manage expectations. We talked about a wee bit earlier on. Make sure that you're not giving anybody a line of, of BS and you're telling, don't never tell a lie for sure. You need to understand that there's no such thing as a secret. I'm sure you've all bumped into that, that in even your regular work a day life uh, when, when business was normal, is that secrets cannot be kept. If you tell somebody something about a, say for example, that somebody negotiates a better pay raise, that's, that secret is only lasts as long as that person is in your office. As soon as they go outside of your building, that's going to get completely out in the rest of the conversation, the rest of the company. Sorry, there's a little typo there. We need to control our emotions. So even though we are worried and scared, we can admit that out loud. We can tell people we're concerned or nervous or scared or, un or unsure of what's going to happen next. But we need not to have that in our voice. We need to be calm. Um, I, I, when I was doing big disaster work in Red Cross, one of my, uh, my communications manager, Tracy, she was brilliant and lovely and, and, and super, super smart. And she always had a line and she said, if, if you ever were running through the building, I would be, I wouldn't even know, care what it was. I'd be out the front door so fast your head would spin because I always worked hard at walking slowly, taking my time, talking slowly, taking my lunch breaks. I know it's a little harder when we're having video, living in this video environment, but what if you were to consider with your team just having a, a Zoom lunch break where there wasn't an wasn't an agenda, but everyone could eat or have a coffee together and just talk about what's going on at home. Or uh, in these days, what's a you know a great conversation starter is you know what's the weirdest thing you've watched on Netflix, um, or whatever it might be. But that gives you an opportunity to be calm and relaxed and look after yourself. Um, the other part about controlling your emotions is even when things are busy and frenetic and and, and hyperactive, especially in the in your role as an HR professional right now, laying off people or managing people's uh, uh, government assistance or unemployment insurance, whatever it might be, is that you need to never be look seen to be uh, flustered. So make sure you're getting good sleep. Don't be responding to emails in the middle of the night. Set parameters and boundaries for yourself and always be seen to be in charge and in control like the old line about being a duck, right? The duck is on the pond, calm, relaxed, serene on top of the water and paddling like hell underneath. When we're talking to people, be human, but not stupid. Even if it's funny, even if it's the funniest thing you've ever heard in your life, don't be a comedian because the, the joke does not always translate. Trust me, I tried and it's often it doesn't work. Understand that the internet never forgets. So a flaming email, saying something stupid in a meeting or at work, like if, if, the, if you're, you or your uh, bosses or the leadership of your organization do not understand for one moment that everything is being, uh, could potentially be caught on camera and posted on the internet in a minute and it never forgets. The internet never forgets. Know your audience. You're talking to the public, your stakeholders, your employees. Make sure that you're speaking to them in an appropriate, respectful manner, not talking down to them and not talking over their head. Be a human being. Understand that you have a lot of goodwill. I always recall uh, in Red Cross, we would get these na I mean, nasty, terrible phone calls. People would phone up. Oh my gosh, you guys are a bunch of thieves and bastards, blah, 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 blah. And I'm never going to give to Red Cross ever again. Now, they would never talk to me like that, but they would talk to our poor receptionist like that. At a certain point, we gathered some names and information. We found out they never gave to Red Cross uh, in the first place. So people give you some slack. They know you're trying hard. If you follow those guidelines that I talked about to, point to, to now, 
they will, you will build up trust and goodwill and they understand that you don't know, but they will not forgive you telling them a lie. And in crisis, it's easy to forget about your values. We all have internal values. We all have an ethos that we purport and try to live by. And if you can all measure up against that, I think you'll be in good shape. Here's the simple, super simple guidelines for living to your values is that you should always be able to explain what you do and what you say to your kids or your grandmother. Before you do something, can, can you go home tonight and if your kids ask you what did you do at work today and you can't justify what you did and explain to them what they did in a way that they understand and can appreciate, then maybe you're not doing the right thing that's true to your values. And you'll have to figure that out on your own, sorry. But uh, you, you'll have to figure that out because that's important. If you can't sleep at night, you can't look yourself in the face in the mirror in the morning, then you've gone sideways on this uh, crisis management issue uh, in general. And transparency is always share information, be, be out there, be public, make sure people know what's going on. And now we get to be creative though. This is the exciting part of a crisis. When something goes sideways, it go, things get turned upside by a flood, a tsunami, a forest fire. There's an opportunity here, much to the uh, misfortune of the people directly impacted, for us to be creative as leaders. And we're going to come out on the other side of this. No one can tell us exactly when right now, but we're going to come through this. And how can we do that? Well, as HR professionals, I know you know, we don't, you don't always have full control over budgets and the like, but now is the time to double down on development, on team development and personal development of your employees. How can you invest in people? If they're at home, can you get them on an online course? Can we start, can we start having conversations with them about their career and their adventure with your company and how can we help them out? Now's the time to invest because there's not, they're not really doing anything else. So take advantage of the space. I've been lucky in my life to be a boss and a leader of very powerful, high impact teams, like unbelievable. The teams that, that I took led or helped lead into uh, combat situations, the teams that I led to respond to disasters and SARS and tsunamis and forest fires, whatever it is, that, those people on the team were like infinitely smarter than I was. Like, I'm not that bright. I'm a good guy and I think I'm pretty smart, but I'm not that bright to solve every problem. And I would just engage those people and trying to figure out how can we solve this? How can we fix this problem? And I have to tell you that the power, the intellectual horsepower of those people combined, especially, was unbelievable. And I would argue that we will never be the same. I don't think that we will, anyone will come through COVID in the same, any company or even person for that matter, will be the same as what they were in December of 2019 as they will be in December of 2020 or 2021. And I would argue there will be a lot of people that fail. Not, some will fail because of business, because they're you know, hairdressers or restaurants or bars because they had no clients, no money, which is a tragedy. But a number will fail because they're unhealthy organizations and they will not make it through this a lot. And if we can invest on in being healthy and strong, we will survive and potentially, hopefully we will thrive. But if we don't, I suspect likely that we're not going to be. So what's it going to look like in July of this year, November of this year, or even 20, next year, 2021 and beyond? How do we set ourselves up to be creative? Well, I, you may have heard the term zero-based budgeting. I, I've kind of coined, I don't know if it's, I'll, I'll take credit for it. I don't think, it, I think I've coined this, so uh, I might as well make some t-shirts up on it and make some money. But instead of zero-based budgeting, which is like start your budgeting process at zero each year and, just, and build the, instead of adding 5% or 10%, I think we have to take an approach of team-based, team approach to zero-based planning. So, this is when you get these smart people in a room. Picture starting over. If we didn't exist, if our team or our company or our 
division or our nonprofit or even whatever, our club, our, our social groups didn't even exist, how would we start over? What would it do? What would it look like? What would be our goal? How can we structure this? No one can tell me that I drive, when I go downtown or do, do some calls or get on the road today, that all of these people, what were they doing before? Like the roads are empty, people are working from home. How can we restructure our organization post COVID? What's working well now? Like how are we, we responding to COVID and the pandemic and self isolation currently that is actually helping us work better? How can we figure out what's the parts that are working well and how can we roll that into this new uh, organization that's going to come out of COVID in the future? And how do we disperse a responsibility and accountability to all of our people and increase it? How do we let them be engaged and fully responsible and fully accountable for what they're thinking? Can we redesign anything? Is our team effective? Was it effective before? Was there something that we thought, geez, if we only had space and time to do, we would do it this way? Let's redesign it. Look at all of the food service companies and the beer guys, the craft brewery guys. All of a sudden, they're redesigning their whole business because it was a crisis. They had to, or they would have failed. So what can we as leaders, even within our own HR department and teams, what can we redesign to make this work? And more, most importantly, like how will it look? How will we know when we get there? When we come through this, what will it look like? And I think these are all valid questions. And these are the things we should be sharing with our team uh, as, a, as a working group, bringing them together and just take one of these sub or one of these comments or bullet points and pose it to the team and start people thinking about bringing it together. These wonderful ideas, these smart people that work for us, they will generate ideas that you couldn't even imagine. And then it's for us as leaders in a crisis to be able to start pulling out the good ideas. How do we do this? We gotta slow down. First off, we have to be exceedingly human. As we mentioned earlier, we have to lean into our people and be very human with them. Ask them how things are going at home. We do one-on-one -on -one check ins with our people. We should be saying, like, what's going well at home? Are you, how do you need any help? Uh, some people might be struggling with homeschooling. Uh, I actually quite, I'm quite worried about our future because I'm a little bit on the old side of life and I'm getting to the point where I'm not sure I want to have a whole bunch of nurses, doctors, and teachers running around that were homeschooled by day drinkers during COVID in 2019 or 2020. So, and we need to begin to, to slow down and micromanage in the very best sense of the word, not interfering in how they do their job, but always being talking and conversational and checking out what's going well, where do you need help? How can I help you be successful with this goal that we got you in right now? So your role as a leader quite frankly, and at any time, but especially in a crisis, especially now in COVID, is we need to trade comfort for future success. As a boss, our number one job is that number one bullet point. And that means if there's an uncomfortable conversation that has to be had, we got to jump on top of that. We can't let it fester because our people are, are spread out from us by, by miles, miles and miles. And and if there's something going wrong, it can get completely out of control because at least hopefully in an office, the team can hold, kind of rein things in. But as a boss, we have to trade our immediate comfort for future success. We have to invest not just, well, this should happen at any rate, but, but we have to learn how to run great video meetings and telephone meetings. We need to figure out how we can work with this. And this could be a conversation. I'm not saying you have to figure it all on your own. Have a conversation with your team. How can we run meetings that are tight, efficient, engaged, so the people on our teams can be super powerfully engaged and don't tune out and playing with their cell phone or watching Netflix out of the corner of their eye because they're at home and you can't see what's really going on. As a boss, we need to take sole personal and sole responsibility for developing our team. This is not the time 
for letting other people think about stuff. We have space and energy and time right now to invest in developing our team. And we can do that by investing it or not investing. It doesn't take any money. We can find some good TED Talks, share a TED Talk with everybody and say, okay, watch this TED Talk uh, by Patrick, uh, Simon Sinek or Patrick Monscioni or any of these other leadership gurus and thinkers and then bring it back to the table and say, let's have a conversation about what we learned and what we did. How can we develop ourselves better? We need to invest and manage our direct reports as individuals. So we need to recognize that each person is their own person with their own skills and challenges and their problems at home and whatever it is that are very unique to that person. And we really need to invest in that part of our job. And the last point for us as leaders in a crisis is to become the chief reminder officer. And I say this is in a couple of fronts. One is we need to continually remind people that yes, you're at home uh, working from home, but yes, you still have a top job to do. And yes, do you understand where you fit into the organization and how are we going to move forward as a company? And importantly, we need to be reminding people that we care and that we're engaged in their lives. And, uh, and I would say that it's at a certain point in here, we also have to be continually reminding everybody of what is our rallying call, call for our team. So one of the things we need to do here, we'll talk about it in a few more minutes, is develop a rallying cry, the standard that everyone's going to move forward. Like what is the most important work we should be doing right now so we can get through COVID and be super successful. So this is just a time graph of time that the far your on the far left of the screen, it should be if you were to say 2018, 2019, January, if you can only imagine January was like what three months ago, four months ago, and then 2021 and beyond. And we need to bring our people along with that. Well, what happens when we have a crisis like COVID? It, it interrupts that timeline. And as I mentioned earlier, we can never, ever be able to go straight across that timeline again. It will change. It has changed and will not go back to normal. And we will have a dip of some sort. And I would say right now we're in the dip. We're probably coming down the curve. We're not going up yet because we got to get through this yet. We got probably another month or two before we get through this. And what happens when you bump into these things is that about 20% of the people will turn and flee, run the other way away from the crisis. They want nothing to do with it. And then there's that 20, 10 to 20% of people that will say, hey boss, whatever it is, I'm in, let's go. Let's leap towards this future uh, world where dragon, there's no dragons and dogs will sleep with cats and the rain will only rain on the flower beds and the golf courses at night, just enough to keep it pretty. And the rest of the days will be sunshine and roses and unicorns. And they're going to jump. They're just because they're that kind of personality. But most of us, 60 to 80 percent of the, your people, will start going down into that groove. And there's a chance they're going to get into a rut at the bottom of the groove. And our job, quite frankly, is to keep those, not to worry about the 10%, the 20% that run back. Don't worry about those people. And don't worry about the ones that leap over. They're the ones that we've got in our pocket. They, they're believers. But we're gonna to have to crawl down into that gully, into that groove, into that valley. And we're gonna to have to find those people that are stuck in the rut. They can be stuck in the rut because they're unsure. We haven't done a good job as a boss of clarifying what's happening. They could be afraid, scared, they could have family or some other emotional or health problems or mental health problems, <clears throat> excuse me, that they're stuck. Excuse me. And our job is to go down into the valley and grab those people and cajole and we'll push and shove and fork, not force, but work them up the, up the other side of the valley so that when we hit 2021, we can all go forward together. And, and most people, I would argue, will go back and spend all their time worrying about the ones that run away and forget about the majority of people at the bottom of the valley in the rut. So don't worry about those people. Let them go. 
even in disasters, I used to have an awful, it was a terrible lesson <clears throat> to teach people, quite frankly. But, you know, one of the things <clears throat> we would always say is, no matter how hard we try, no matter how much we do, how much money we spend, some people will not recover. So what, why, that doesn't mean we write them off and we let them suffer in pain and starve to death, but we spend our time with the majority of people that have the potential of recovering and the people we need so the community, our organization, our, our city, our country can respond and move forward together. <clears throat> Pardon me. Healthy teams get results. So there's a bicycle race, if you can imagine. An average is, uh, it goes from one, the west coast of the United States to the east coast. Excuse me. And it, and it generally, an average is about 3,200 miles. So whatever that is, probably around 5,000 kilometers. And and it's every year, it's supposed to be coming up this year at a certain point, I think it might be canceled now because of COVID. But I think one of the interesting points of this <coughs> race across America concept is the fastest single time. So one person riding one uh, a bike across the United States, the fastest time on record for 320 miles, 3,020 miles, sorry, is seven hours, seven days, 15 hours, almost 16 hours. A two person team working together in tandem, the fastest time at the same, same distance, 3,020 miles is six hours, and, uh, sorry, six days and 10 hours. And remarkably and astoundingly, an eight person team did it in five days and three hours. The point is that together, a team working together gets infinitely more and better results, faster, more impactful than anybody working by themselves. So as I'm winding up my part of the conversation here today, I'd like to just offer, and this is a free gratis offer that you're welcome to take me up on at any time, is if you wanna have a one hour team building team, uh, team building exercise with me on Zoom, I'm happy to set it up. If you need help working on what your team rallying cry, what's that single most important thing you should be working on, I'm happy to have that conversation with you. And always, I offer this to all of my clients, uh, all of my uh, audiences and when I speak, is that if you have a, if you just need an ear to bounce an idea off or uh, someone to listen to or some help problem solving, all you have to do is reach out. I would be sad and a little bit disappointed that if you were running into trouble and, and needed help that you didn't tr reach out to me because you didn't think I, I would listen. I'm happy to, there's no obligation, there's no fees, there's no nothing. This is just what it is. And, and the other offer that I would suggest that you for you is uh, on my website, you can get to it through stephenarmstrong.ca. There's lots of great stuff there about conversations, about leadership and and there is a couple of places on every web page where you can uh, sign up for a copy, a PDF version of my book, You Can't Lead From Behind. It's about an hour's read. My mom's super proud of it. It's best, she says it's the best book I ever wrote. And, uh, and it's, people get, seem to get a lot out of it. And I offer that to everybody on the call. And if you want, you're more than welcome to, to go get it. Um, I'm going to think I'm going to turn on my video, Janice. I'm ready for you to ask me anything. <laughs> How exciting is that? That's pretty exciting, Steve. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much for all that great information. Um, we got some questions in our question box, and I've got a few written on my paper, too. And sure. folks that are on the webinar with us, um, feel free to put more questions in the question box on your screen. So first one for you, Steve. Uh, this person says, I could spend the whole day chasing rumors. Any comments on how to manage rumors? And especially in this time, we're all virtual. Sure. So I, I wouldn't chase it all day, first off. Um, I, I'd probably just keep notes. What are you hearing? And then I would address it. You know, if you, I would say you should have at least, at least one team call a day 
And maybe it's at that point, you just address what you know. And, and instead of responding to rumors, uh, present facts, right? So instead of saying, well, somebody, I heard this, I heard this with a company, I heard this with so-and-so, just come right out and take it off the table in the front. Mm. I find, I always found that by taking, answering the question up front, if I, if I thought it was an issue, when I used to, when I was at Red Cross, we used to uh, spend a lot of time with government because it's just kind of what we do, part of our job. And if I knew there was a contentious issue, I'd address it right away, <laughs> take it right off the table. And uh, if you have people have confidence in you and trust in you, then then you've you've addressed it. So things like uh, I don't know, let's pick something. Uh, layoffs probably most most rumors these days are on layoffs or companies in trouble. You know, open your books. Have some, try to convince your CEO or your CFO or your president whatever to to put an online uh, town hall on the table where they open the books. Here's the profit and loss statement for the last few months. We're still healthy. We're still good. Um, you know, these are concerns. This is where we could go forward. So uh, instead of responding to rumors, yes, it's respond to rumors, but instead of being uh, reactive to rumors, be proactive with facts. That's a good way to think about it. And I know there are sometimes things that we can't, um, we don't want to contribute to rumors, but we either don't have the information or it's just not something that we can share right now. Um, but I think your advice is share whatever you can. If you can share it, yeah. then share it. And if you can't answer, if you can't answer the question because it's confidential, like like lots of like especially in the HR department, you know lots of secrets. Um, you just say, I, I'm sorry, I cannot, I can't share that information with you right now. Mm, yeah. But Thank be you. honest about that part of it too. Like, no, I can't, I can't tell you that. <laughs> yeah. Um, Next question. This is a good one too. Um, this person writes, and I'll, I'll give you this little bit of compliment here. This is some great information. Thank you. In this environment, team members need to be multitasking more than ever. How do you feel that this will impact their ability to be engaged fully in tasks or responsibilities around their role? Oh, this is a great question. Like, honestly, if you, I think this is where, this is where we as bosses are going to have a problem. And HR, I would suggest the HR profession. People have been working on their own and multitasking and doing stuff on their own. They are never going to sit back in their little cubicle again and be satisfied. <laughs> so this is the part about moving forward, right? This is the part about what's the rallying cry we're looking for. How can we work on engaging people better in the future? And if you have a bigger, better vision, a bigger, better, even if all you can control is your own department, like, what could you do? How could you get people to get excited about making it better? Mm -hmm. And in a way that, okay, sorry, uh, sorry, Robert, you're going to have to go back in that cubicle and punch in data from now until the end of time. But last week, we trusted you with managing a layoff of 7,900 people, right? This doesn't make sense. No one's ever going to go back. That's why if you take one thing from this, no one's ever going to go back to what they were before. Imagine, I heard a guy, a uh, speaker, a uh, podcast just recently, yesterday, I think, like universities, they got all of this bricks and mortars and labs and stuff like that. And now they're teaching everything online. If, am I going to go send my kids to university and pay 7,000 bucks a year for a uh, room and board uh, when they're getting, like, I don't, I'm not saying that's ideal, but people are going to push back on what used to be even two months ago. They're going to be pushing back and your employees will push back. They said, look, you trusted me to work on my own at home for the last two months. Now you won't let me go back home. Forget it. Hmm. Right. So we have to stay ahead of that. That takes us, uh, uh, that generates another thought for me, another question. The idea that, um, we all have our way that we've been working all along and that we, we, we think this is how the world of work is, but you're absolutely right. I think there's going to be a lot of pushback um, about going back to the way things were. What advice do you have for um, folks on this webinar to open their own minds to what might change? Because I think sometimes we're, we're our own worst enemies in terms of being flexible thinkers. Mm. Well, I would suggest uh, a couple of things. Uh, 
it kind of uh, there's a there's a couple of slides that we talked about like what's working well now in the COVID like what part of your job is working really well and where are you struggling mm -hmm. and and invest in those kind of things um, if if you are a leader or an informal leader like lots of HR people are informal leaders with the organization like how can you start putting influence to getting things changed in a way that's a, how can you raise the right conversations Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, I think um, you can't change your boss. You can't change your boss's mind. Like, it's hard. <laughs> you can't fight your boss and win because you'll lose. That's just mm -hmm. the way it is. That sucks. But if you can really start raising a different conversation around who are thoughtful people about how you can make it better, I think that that is our role as, as an HR professional or as a middle manager. One of, it, the, one of the things I learned in the Army the best was, my bosses expected me to bring solutions to the table, like bring, be helpful, challenge and push back. I know that's counterintuitive to what most people think about the military or the army, but uh, I always found that the same. I find it more, less so in civilian world. So I do know you have to be careful with that. Um, but like start listening to podcasts, get tuned into some of these guys, Linsconi and Simon Sinek and, all these people that are way infinitely a billion times smarter than I am. And, and just to frame it in a different way, like it's, it's, you know, how are people thinking about this? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, I have one here. Um, it's a little bit in a slightly different direction. Yeah. Do you have some quick words of encouragement in leadership for the long-term care sector? Oh my gosh. I love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And I know your business. So, So this is what I would say. You have a terrible job and not, not, not a terrible, the work is the work you do is important and vital and important. Um, it's terrible in that I would suggest of all of the industries that will be impacted by this, the most will be health in general and long-term care specifically. Um, so this is, this is the suggestion. I, the encouragement I would give you is you're awesome and you're doing a good job and you've never been you've never been paid enough and you likely never will be paid enough because it's a it's a quantity volume. I know that business a little bit, and it's a quantity volume model of making a profit. What I would suggest as as a boss, as a leader, or an HR person is like what part of this gigantic, huge, complex organization or system that we, you are in the middle of and under the gun of that you can control. What parts to, can you manage with your people? And, and try not to listen to the noise because the noise is out there and it's gonna get worse, I'm sorry, because every politician with a megaphone is gonna be standing up ranting and raving about uh, how we've mistreated the seniors, which is quite frankly my own uh, editorialization is their freaking fault because they set the system up that way. That's, that's I'm getting towards the end of the webinar, so I got a little. <laughs> Janice won't unplug me over that. You can't start misbehaving now. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say that, that find the spots you can control. Encourage your people. I would say take some of the lessons that are the points that we've covered in this even this webinar and some of the other things. And how can you be human about it? Like how can how can you talk to people in a way and say, look, I understand this is tough. Buy people some space. Like, I don't know if you've ever been around somebody in a work environment that died, that you were personally responsible for it or got seriously hurt. I have, unfortunately, you know, like how can you, how can you protect your people when they're watching frail, vulnerable seniors die of a terrible disease and someone else is on the news that night yelling at them that was their responsibility. So how can you support these people? And I think at the end of this, if you can come out of it with your team intact, maybe not your company, maybe not, but your team, the people you are personally responsible for, that you've done the best you can, I think that's as good as you can hope for. And I don't think, actually think that's a bad thing. I think that's a very honorable result. Mm. That's great. Thank you. Um, trust is a big issue. You talked lots about trust and we know it, it's a big, uh, a big issue and a big pillar, both before this time and now. 
Question here is, how do we support our leadership to embrace trust as the best way to lead in this time and going forward? So I assume this is somebody that, like this person's leadership above them? Yeah, I, that's I how it gather, yeah. Yeah. So uh, first off, uh, we all know this, but it's important that we, I should, just gonna remind everybody, like the last thing you should be doing is walking around bad mouthing anybody. <laughs> Like that's bad. That's just that makes you look bad, makes them look bad. Um, I think one of the things we have to do is to be able to figure out, and everyone's different, but we need to figure out how can we enter the room and the conversation in a way that's helpful for them. Mm -hmm. And and not and one of the things we have to avoid is uh, never uh, try never to embarrass anybody. But so for example. I had a boss one time and just the way they talked was a little bit insulting to people. They come across that way. I knew the person well, and I know they didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but they came across poorly. And so what the way I would suggest is to go with, I went in the room and I said, look, I know, I know you're a great person and I know you want nothing but the best for a company, but did you, did you understand how this comes across when you said, uh, this statement, then this is how people felt when they heard it. That's a very private conversation, right? So this is not in a meeting. This is somewhere where, because what happens when that the stuff comes up in a meeting, then somebody gets defensive and then you sh they shut down. So you have to figure out how you can have these conversations around what's happening in the company, how you can uh, bring ideas forward in a respectful manner. So uh, the one of the tools that I try to teach so I hope probably another hour's worth of conversation on this particular point is if you're talking to somebody, you should start with the facts of the situation. What's really going on? What, what are the feelings? What are the emotions and the feelings about what's happening? And how can we address it with the future? So the three Fs, four Fs, five Fs, three Fs. Um, so what are the facts? Uh, what, are the, what are the feelings, emotions? Um, and then what is the future? How can we move forward? So if you approach your boss, your leadership team with these are the facts. Okay, this is how people feel about the facts. So how you present the numbers or how you present the layoff. Uh, this is what how people felt about this and how can we move forward? I'm not sure if that's super helpful, but I think yeah. that's the approach out. Yeah, but it should be offline, especially with this one, you know, if you're the HR director or manager and there's a president or a general manager or a CEO, the last thing you need to do is embarrass that person because mm -hmm. the, the stress that that person's under right now is like over the top, unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So how can you get, take me? Even, one of the things I used to like to do is go for a walk, get out of the building. I know it's hard right now, but... Uh, <laughs> But maybe it's not hard. Maybe a walk is what you could. Let's meet down at Carbon. I live in Riverbend here in Calgary and Carbon Park's right here. So let's meet at Carbon Park and we'll go for a walk and I'll bring the coffee and I want to talk to you about a few things. Hmm. Get Sounds them good. out of their environment so that they're a little you know, more comfortable, a little bit off balance too. That's always helpful. <laughs> Thank you so much, Steve. I have one more question. Um, yeah. You talked earlier about the importance of keeping yourself calm when you're leading mm. people. Any advice you would give to the folks listening on how to stay calm yourself when you're leading other people? Yeah. Whether and as you've already said, whether you're an informal HR leader or whether you're or you have a title of leader. Yeah. So uh, you can tell now that you can see my beautiful, fully headed hair that I'm not brand new. Um, and when I was brand new, uh, this was tough for me. Like my emotions were on my sleeve and staying calm was not my strength. Uh, what, what, in my own level of growth, personal growth and maturity, what, I, what I've come to realize so is, is, and this is the lesson I'll leave with people. First off, assume that people are trying their best. <laughs> I've never once heard of anybody waking up in the morning and kissing their spouse on the cheek and petting their dog and saying goodbye to the kids, getting in the car or getting on Zoom now and going to work with a fully thoughtful, rational intention of doing a crappy job. People want to do good work. So if you come at people uh, to stay calm is if you just always take this the approach that, okay, they're well, I don't really understand what's happening here, but I'm going to assume that they're here for the right reasons and things are going to happen. The other 
part about staying calm is there is no need to hit, as I said earlier, facts, feelings, future. There's no need to hit the feeling, the feelings and emotion button first, <laughs> right? Because then that's just the, uh, that's the ignition to an explosion. So what, remind yourself of what are the facts of what's going on here? Why am I feeling the way I'm feeling? And I found um, in my experience, except, you know, one-on-one -on -one relation to uh, connections is a little bit challenging, but if you're running into something that's a little weird, it's unsettling and you're getting emotional about it, I always try to write it out. I try to write like a, like a little personal position statement for paper to myself. Like, why am I feeling this way? And if I can articulate it in writing, then it takes the, a lot of the emotion out of it. The, the last thing I would say is, uh, be very purposeful in slowing down. Walk slow. Um, in the military, when we were on operations, uh, when you when you pull a trigger on a rifle, you take a deep breath. You let it all the way out. Take a deep breath, and then you let it halfway out, and then that's when you pull the trigger. So take deep breaths. And think about before you pull the trigger, make sure you're being very thoughtful about what's happening. And I think, honestly, I think if you come from at the approach that no matter who it is, no matter how big a jerk you think they are, if you take the assumption that, okay, they, they're trying their best. I don't, don't agree, but if they're trying their best. And then if you come back out of that and try to figure out why is this upsetting me? Like, why is this bothering me? And you, like I write it out, even a little note to myself. Um, and then the final thing is just to take the space and time to uh, breathe, think before you react. Because I know, and I'm sure there might be even people on this phone call right now that have seen me go the opposite, react, think. And then you got to write an apology and then it's bad and someone's yelling at you <laughs> and it's awful. But if you go, if you take that other approach, you know, make, 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 good, make a good assumption about people, give them some credit. Think about why you're feeling the way you're feeling, and then and then respond and try to respond in a calm way. Steve, thank uh, you. Oh, sorry, I just want to say lastly, uh, if, if you're at home, especially, uh, and I'm not the best advice on this one. Stay away from the coffee. I only drink like two pots a day, so if I cut it back, it's good. Uh, try to look after yourself, eat well, sleep well. All those things help. It's, it sounds like your mom yelling at you, but it's true. Well, these are all things that help you stay calm. Steve, thank you so much for your, your, uh, everything that you've shared, your knowledge and your advice. Um, we had quite a few questions about the link for your book. So we'll include that when we send the slides and the recording to everybody tomorrow. So um, they'll all know how to get in touch with you. So thank you very much sure. for today and um, all the best. All right. And thank you, everybody. And please, I would... And at any, any moment, I'm the second easiest guy in Canada to get a hold of. So if you need some help, just text, write, email, phone. Thank you so much. Take care. Take care, everybody. Good luck. Don't lick any COVID.